Let's pray. Our Father God, again we come to you tonight, thanking you for the many blessings this morning, for your presence among us in our midst, for the Sunday school classes, Father, that were taught by faithful teachers, by men and women, Father, who gave up time and gave up effort so that they could bring your word to people today. And Father, we have come tonight bearing our hearts to be filled to overflowing, that your word would speak to each and every heart, that your word, Father, would be manifest in the lives of each and every person here tonight. And Father God, again, we lift up our brothers and sisters all over the world that are suffering in persecution, who are imprisoned, Father, for the sake of Jesus. Our Arab, Arab brothers, Father, who are right now in prison in Iran and Iraq and places of that nature. Perhaps even the Christian brothers and sisters in Syria and in Lebanon who suffer for Jesus. We lift them up, Father, and pray for them tonight and ask that you would give them mercy, give them strength, give them grace. And those, Father, in many other nations that they are suffering for the sake of Jesus, that you would encourage them, give them strength. Be with us tonight, Father, as we open your word, that our hearts would be open to receive your message. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's turn to our Bibles, to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Now, Jesus' teaching and his preaching is going throughout the country. His message of repentance and salvation reached the ears of many people. Thousands of individuals are following him. I, every time I hear that or read that, I think of the cloud of dust, perhaps off in the distance, as you see perhaps ten to 15,000 people walking those desert highways highways following Jesus, going where he went to see all that he was doing. Folks, people were absolutely astounded during his years of popularity. We find in our text today, however, there is one person who did not find his message so pleasing. We, feel, we find that rather it's caused him much distress and much pain. You see, he had a problem. He had a sin problem. He thought he had solved his problem by putting away his sin, hiding his sin, perhaps even eliminating his sin problem. But sin without repentance always returns. Let me say that again. Sin without repentance always returns. Sin without repentance always enslaves. John in his epistle, or excuse me, James in his epistle explains the ugly matter of sin like this. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Sin is our enemy. We are born into it. We live into it. No one had to teach you how to sin. Your mom and daddy didn't set you down and teach you how to sin. It is a natural fact in our life. King Herod is the main focus in our text tonight. He has a problem. He has a sin problem, and that sin problem has resurrected in his heart again. Will it drive him to God and to repentance, or will it drive him to the grave and ruin? Let's look at our text today, and we're going to see that this man who had the problem, how he dealt with it. And folks, let it teach us as we walk in our daily lives. That sin is a matter of terror. Sin is a matter that we must deal with. If we do not deal with it, it will resurrect. 
and it will follow us. And it will deal with our lives in ways that we cannot afford to pay. Sometimes it will wait for a few weeks, a few months, perhaps even a few years. But it always comes back. It always seeks to destroy. It always seeks to bring death of any relationship, of any life, of any individual. Let's start with verse 14 in Mark chapter 6. Now King Herod heard of him, your H is capitalized in him, that means Jesus. For his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said it is Elijah, and others said it is a prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John. When I beheaded, whom I beheaded, he had, had been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not. I thought I had problems. Verse 20, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod, and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. What a fool! So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. That makes me cringe just thinking about it. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sor sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king set an executioner, sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison. Brought his, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. What a Mother's Day gift, huh? And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. We're going to see two things today. We're going to see the conviction, or three things. We're going to see the conviction of a sinful lifestyle. We're going to see the compulsion of a shameful living. And we're going to see the conscience of a stained life. Sin is our number one enemy as death comes with sin. If there were no sin, there would be no death. People tend to put the heart cart before the horse when in reality it is sin that brings death. How could God do this to me? I've heard people over and over again. How can, how can God allow people to die? How can He allow Himself? Folks, you're putting the cart before the horse. How can I sin? How can I do what I do that allows these things to come into my life? Sin is our enemy. In verse 17 through 20, we see a conviction of a sinful lifestyle. Many were troubled by the message of God. See, that's the problem. Preachers aren't always real popular, you understand. We're going through one of those eras and those times when preachers are not the most popular person on the, on, the, on the speaking scene. We don't always get invited to all the cocktail parties, you understand. Many times I'm the last person to know what in the world is going on in the first place. That's okay, I don't have a problem with that. I'd rather not know all of it, to be honest with you. We see in verse 17 to 19 the message of God. The sin of Herod is revealed in verse 17. Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John, bound him in prison. 
his sin of abduction, took the preacher, the Baptist preacher, and said, I'm going to, I had a guy say the other day on the radio, that John the, ba John the Baptist wasn't Baptist. Well, yes, he was. <laughs> John the Baptist, it says so right there. <laughs> he may not have been the, the Southern Baptist because he was up from up north, up by Nazareth area, but the, the bottom line was he was a Baptist. But we see his, his sin of abduction. He took John the Baptist, falsely imprisoned him. Don't tick off a powerful person unless you're willing to pay the penalty. You don't think that boss will fire you if you tick him off? Go ahead and try it tomorrow. You say, oh, you don't know. I'd like to tell him off. Well, you'd like to get a paycheck too. Jesus said, be harmless as doves and wise as a serpent. But John the Baptist was not holding anything back, and Herod decided to abduct him. And then we see a sin of adultery. Now, he married his brother's wife. His brother divorced her, of course. And so Herod said, hey, I, hey, let's keep it in the family, I guess, you know, and married Herodias. Now, folks, that was against Jewish law. And John the Baptist just happened to mention it to him as he was going by, passing Herod, you're sinning against God. Now, here's an issue I want you to understand. This is an important issue. This is one of those things you say, okay, self, it's time to stop and listen to this principle. You cannot cover up sin by committing more sin. Let me say that again very carefully. Mark it down. Write it down. Put it in your brain. Hold this principle tight. You cannot cover up sin by committing more sin. But they do, don't they? They try. One sin leads to another. Did you take that cookie? Well, no. Well, why do you have cookie crumbs around your table where you're sitting? Well, I don't know. I just sat down. We see the sin of Herod in verse 18, the sermon of holiness. John the Baptist told him in verse 18, remember the law. Because John had said to Herod, it's not lawful. Remember the law. Not too many people like to hear that. Oh, there you go talking about that Bible thing. Deborah and I witnessed to a guy, and I share with this to you every once in a while. I never had an experience like this before. We shared it with a guy we were going to college with when we were undergraduate uh, in our school. And every time we mentioned the Bible, he would begin to curse. I've never heard such foul language about the Bible. And I was been in the Marine Corps, Marine Corps right before that time. Just mentioned the Bible and suddenly, oh, that blankety blank book. It blankety. Folks, listen, you don't even have to read it. You just say the Bible and people go spazoid. They absolutely go crazy. Why? Because the law is convicting. It's meant to be convicting. It was given to us to be convicting. Paul said the law is our school teacher. It's a schoolmaster. It teaches us you're sinful. That's what the law does. So when John the Baptist said it's not lawful, remember the law it was a challenge of conviction. And then we see the repent of your lust, a call of change. Look again at verse 18. It's not lawful for do you have your brother's wife. I know who she is. The whole country knows who she is. All these sirens or whatever you want to call them, these, these uh, uh, sweet little ladies out in the Hollywood scene get in there and do all their things and flaunt themselves around and all these guys run after them like they're a bunch of crazy people. All the people in Washington, all their sin, folks, listen. The Bible says very simply, know ye not, okay, that your sin is going to be found out. Your sin will be found out. May not be tomorrow. May not be in a month. May not be next week. But it'll be found out. If it has to be even with God's judgment. So, remember the law, repent of your lust, it's a call to change. God's challenge of conviction is always a call for change. 
That's why we don't want it. We don't want to change. Well, I don't like to change. Why do I have to change? Well, folks, that's what repentance is. Repentance is changing your lifestyle. Next, we see in verse 19, the storm of Herodias. <laughs> A storm rolls into the... Have you heard what that Baptist preacher has been saying about me? Can you believe that? Her vendetta threatened extermination. Look at verse 19. Therefore, Herodias held it against him. Now, I've had that happen in my sermons before. But... <laughs> It says here, and wanted to kill him. I don't know of how many people wanted to kill me. I don't think I've had that problem yet. I can't imagine having a sermon and somebody saying, you know, I'm going to just kill him. I have felt like that perhaps an occasion or two, but I've never thought that perhaps somebody would think the same of me. She hated the message. Therefore, she hated the messenger. You know, you always heard that old saying, don't shoot them. Don't shoot me. I'm just the messenger. Well, a lot of times the messenger gets the ire of what the message brings. Now, we see not only her vendetta, but we see her vengeance temporarily eluded. We see here in verse 19, and he wanted to kill him, but she could not. By the way, let me say this to you. Nobody can kill you unless God allows it. Jesus told Pilate, you could not do this if God did not give you the power. Here is Jesus under the power of Pilate, or as he thought so. Do you not know that I can have you killed or have you let go? And Jesus said, you have no power that God the Father hasn't given you. So let me say this to you, beloved. They may want to kill you. But they're not going to do a thing unless God allows them to. So just preach on. Verse 20, we see the man of God. We see the message of God. Look at the man of God. In verse 20, many were troubled by the man of God. You know, I, I know it's hard for you to believe, but, I, you know, there are a lot, some people who don't like me. I, I, I see the shock in your face. He heard him preach. You see, Herod reportedly fancied John. He had heard him preach. I like his preaching. He's got a lot of fire in his bones. He's a great preacher, and he liked him preaching, and he had him protected. Look again at verse 20. The Bible says, And he feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. For goodness sake, he had the biggest man in the whole nation saying, Don't touch him. But then it got personal. Then it got personal. We see here in, 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 verse, in verse, uh, uh, verse 20 that Herod respectively feared him. John was honest and genuine. He always told Herod the truth. Herod did not find a lie in John's message. And then we see John was holy and godly. He lived for God without reservation and without fear. You see, the world always fears and hates holy men and women of God. You know why? John said it right. Darkness hates light. Why is that? Because light reveals what is hid in the darkness. That's why preachers aren't the most popular person anymore. We've got a lot of darkness. <laughs> Why do people hate holy men and women of God? Because conviction. Because of conviction. Well, I don't say anything. You know, I'd, I can preach on one subject. I'm, I'm preaching on names, for goodness sake. I, you know, in, in the morning, worship, who would have thought a preacher could preach for almost five weeks? I've got another group. When I come back, I've got a whole new group of names to talk about. For five weeks about names, for goodness sake. How can you... Convict anybody's heart by talking about names. Oh, listen, folks, it's not what I say. It's the word. You just mentioned the names, and God's word is absolutely convicting. But why? Because the Holy Spirit is at work among us. He speaks to your heart as he speaks to mine. So we see the conviction of a sinful lifestyle. 
Next, we see the compulsion of shameless living. In verse 21 through 23, look at the compulsion of Herod's passion. Sin pleases the sinner. Look at verse 21. And then an opportune day came. Oh, there's always an opportune day. Well, you see, God will protect me and it'll never come my way. <laughs> Let me tell you, it will come your way. When Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles and high officers and the chief men of Galilee, sin always has a convenient timing in verse 21. Verse 22, sin always has a convenient temptation. And when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, ask whatever you want, and I will give it to you. As all the old preachers used to say, that girl came in and did her hoochie-coochie. And Herod went whamby-pamby, I guess, you know. The bottom line is, folks, what is worth half your kingdom? What kind of man gives up everything for a dance? My feeling is I think Herod figured out he was going to get a little bit more than just a dance. Shame on him. Shame on mom. Put her daughter up to doing this. You ought to please your stepfather. You ought to please your stepfather this birthday and do something for him. He might give you a great gift. How many mothers in our world today have sold their daughters to Hollywood so that they can have their retirement. I've never seen so many sickening things in my life, looking at television, looking at magazines, looking at movies. Aren't you sick of it by now? Isn't it appalling to you? And yet people look at you like, what's wrong with you? Yes, used to be the language was the big issue. You know, when old Rhett Butler said his one deal thing, you know, everybody went oh, and gasped at his one little. Folks, these people would have a coronary if they'd went to the movie today. I remember the time when the first time I saw a man kiss a man on a preview of a movie. Thing was as quiet as could be. Thank God I had my Marine Corps jacket on. And when they came close, I thought, oh, no. Oh, no. And suddenly the thought went from my brain to my mouth and I yelled, oh, no. And as they embraced and everybody, was, it just sucked the whole air out of the place. I thought, you cannot believe that this is being presented to you. I didn't even come to this stupid movie and you showed me this. I came to a total different thing. What is going on in our world, folks? What are we willing to give up and throw away and do away with so we can have a few nickels? What is our leadership doing in our world today? That they think that James Taylor is going to change the world by singing to someone, you got a friend? Folks, we are a sick society. Just as sick as Herod and Herodias and her daughter. We see in verse 23, sin paralyzes the sinner. It's like a deer in a headlight. Herod was like oh, blubbering all over himself. In verse 23, probably had a few too many cocktails too. Sin stimulated Herod's desire. Don't let me get started on this, but I'll just give you a sidebar for a nickel. Stay away from alcohol. Let me tell you why. It'll destroy your family. It'll destroy your family. I've seen what it did in my family when I was a child. My pastor's father saw what it's done in all his members of his family or his church. My pastor saw what it did in his church. I see what it's done in our church. And let me say this to you. You couldn't sell me that. Sin always has a convenient time. Sin stimulated his desire. Again, James 1, 14, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. It's you, <laughs> not the alcohol. It's you. 
It's your desire. It's my desire. Listen, that's why Joseph ran. He was a human being. He was a man. He had thoughts just like any other man. And when Potiphar's wife said, lie with me, he ran out the door. Finally, he had to leave his coat. She grabbed him so quick. Sin stimulated his desire. Sin subjugated Herod's dignity. Imagine a man of that stature willing to give his half of his kingdom away for a belly dancer. She must have had one belly, huh? The bottom line is how, how could he subjugate his dignity that way? But yet we do. Sin will suppress your better judgment. It will dominate your common sense, and it will sear your conscience. That's why when you take sin and you add alcohol or drugs, it is absolutely a killer cocktail. Imagine destroying your marriage tomorrow because of one, what the, what the society would call an indiscretion that God calls a sin. Imagine losing your wife, losing your children, losing your life, losing everything because of your desire being subjugated by sin. And then sin surrendered Herod's domain. I'll give you what you want. I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. Who would do this? James 1.15, Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Herod was dead before he even left the scene. We see in verses 24 through 29 the compulsion of Herod's pride. Sin's opportunity is simple. Verse 24, there's the surrender to sin. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And, and she said, can you imagine a mother? Can you imagine going to your mom and say, I got a boyfriend. What? He says, anything I want I can have, what should I ask him? How about uh, John the Baptist's head on a platter? Can you imagine that? How gruesome that is. I don't know about you, but I have never watched any of these beheadings on Internet. I refuse to. I don't want to be subjugated to that cruelty and that barbarity. I don't have to see that to know that it is cruel and that it is barbaric. But can you imagine wanting that as a gift? We see... The compulsion of sin, the surrender to sin in verse 24. In verse 25, the situation to sin. Immediately she came in haste to the king. She didn't wait. She didn't stutter. She didn't stop. Mom, how could you ask for that? She went right on, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. I can't imagine sitting in a, in a cell being put in, in a dungeon somewhere because you're preaching, and suddenly somebody shows up and says, oh, by the way, we're going to cut your head off. Now, frankly, folks, that's almost front-page news now. But because you had a dance? Look at verse 26, the sorrow of sin, and the king was exceedingly sorry. Well, he wasn't sorry enough, was he? Yet because of the oath and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. We see how sin affects others, do we not? How sad. Willing to lose everything. Look at verse 27 through 29. Sin's obedience. Sin affected the monarch in verse 27. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. Immediately the Bible says. Sin affected the monarch. In verse 27, sin affected the man. You better believe it affected John. Took his head right off his shoulders. Sin affects not only the person who's involved in it, but sin affects the innocent. Look at verse 28. Sin affected the maiden. In verse 28, and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. Can you imagine walking back? Here, Mommy, <laughs> got something for you. 
Can you imagine that? Do you understand that this goes on in our world today? Oh, it may not be John the Baptist's head, but there are people who cry like O Ahab, o Ahab and, and Queen Jezebel. They cry and whine, you know, I want this and I want that. We're talking presidents, folks. We're talking people in high positions. History has shown us over and over and over again. They're like this Herod and like this, this child, this girl that danced, looking for the most powerful thing they can find, a little bit of power. And you think, girl, you could have had anything. You could have been in charge of your mother. You could have been in charge of anything. You had your own business. You could have had your own parlor to teach dancing. Or what is it called? A dancing studio. We have our own TV program. Dancing with Herodias' daughter. We have verse 28, how it affected the mother. What are you going to do with this? Here, Mom, it's yours. What do you do? Well, you put it on a stick and stick it out in front of your house. I don't know. What do you do with it? You mount it on the wall? She looked at it and thought, I, had, I got you, didn't I? You won't say a word about me anymore, will you? Well, not until the judgment. It's going to be John there. Well, hi, Herodias, how are you? <laughs> when she gets to the judgment seat of God. Long time no see. Guess what? Going to be a lot longer next time. We see in verse 29, sin affected the members, John's disciples. They came. It affects everyone, folks. One sin can be of great effect in the lives of many people. It depends on your position. Imagine the sin of a president, the sin of a king, the sin of a queen, the sin of a monarch of whomever, how that affects millions of people. Last we see, I purposely didn't go into verse 14 and 16 first because I wanted to see the conscience of a stained life. In verse 14, sin's remembrance. The Bible says in verse 14, Now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. You see, in verse 14, his death was remembered. You see, sin has a way of remembrance. You can never let it go. You see, God said, I cast your sins as far as the east from the west to remember them no more. But you and I are not God. Sin's old head, every once in a while, will rear up, won't it? Well, you know, you did that many years ago. Satan's there to tell you. That's why I love that bumper sticker. When, when Satan tells you about your past, you just tell him about his future. And that's the truth, folks. Our sins have been forgiven. They have been cast as far as the east from the west to be remembered no more. Herod's sins were still alive and real. The Bible shows us that his death was remembered. He remembered John, that one whom he admired. I love to hear him preach. And then we see his deeds were remembered in verse 14. John the Baptist is risen from the dead. I killed him. And then his doctrine was remembered. And therefore, these powers are at work in him. What? His message is the same. You see, sin has a memory that only forgiveness can erase. Sin has a memory that only forgiveness can erase. 1 John 1, 9. If you'll confess your sins. Now, confession doesn't mean you just acknowledge your sin. Imagine going to a judge and say, well, yeah, yeah, I, I hit them, uh, hit and run. Yeah, I hit them. Uh, okay, so now I get to go home. You know, I, I told you I did it. There's no punishment, right? You know, I did this horrible crime, and, and yes, and, and, I, and I didn't want to say anything until I got caught. And then when I got caught, well, yeah, I, I, I did this. But here's the question. What are you going to do with it? You see, Herod was ad admitted, yeah, I killed John the Baptist, but what is he going to do with it? You see, we see this 
problem of 1 John 1, 9, if you'll confess means to repent. If you'll confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, meaning to cleanse you as if it never happened. Herod didn't have that. Now we see in verse 15, sin's rejection. And others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it's a prophet or like one of the prophets. You see, they saw him as a preacher and not as a Messiah. Oh, this is Jesus of Nazareth. No, no, no. This is Elijah, the prophet. This is a prophet come back from the dead. This is the one like a prophet. Nobody wanted to call him the Messiah. They saw him as a prophet and not a savior. He's a good teacher. You see, sin blinds you to who really Jesus is. You see, first of all, sin has a memory that only forgiveness can erase, but sin will blind you to who Jesus really is. And then verse 16, sin's responsibility. There's a confession of sin. But when Herod heard it, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He confessed it. Recognition and not repentance. He didn't say, oh, I really made a boo-boo, didn't I? He didn't say, gosh, I hate that I did this, and I wish God would forgive me, and I could come to God and ask for forgiveness. No, he didn't say anything like that. We see his confession of sin, but look at his concern for sin in verse 16. Whom I beheaded, he has been raised from the dead. Uh-oh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. You see, remorse all, always allows fear to return. Sin brings fear in your life. It's a fear of being caught. It's a fear of being found out. It's a fear of saying, oh, no, what am I going to do? When in reality, Jesus takes our sin and casts them afar as the east from the west to remember them no more. Hey, if I've got God on my side, as Paul says in Romans, if God be for me, who can be against me? You may, you may go to prison for a, a crime you do. You may go to prison for a sin that you do against, against humanity, but you can find forgiveness even in prison. And though you may have to pay the penalty of your sin, you still have forgiveness to go to heaven. Well, Herod had nothing to do with that. He had a stained life. He had no way of, of wanting he had remembrance, he had rejection, he had responsibility, but he did not have repentance, did he? Sin has an awful price. It costs you more than you're willing to pay. Who would buy something and pay an exorbitant price for it willingly? Can you imagine going into a place and somebody saying, well, you know, that, that, that's about $5,000. Well, that's a hamburger. Why do I want to pay $5,000 for a hamburger? Because I can, I can ask for it. That's why. Nobody would want to do that. But you see, sin has that problem. It makes you pay more than you're willing to pay, and it takes you further than you're willing to go. There's no stopping sin. It'll take you further and further. See, Herod is, was still in the effects of sin. Sin starts out as a fanciful flirtation. It quickly becomes an obedient obsession. And in its full power, sin becomes a lustful lifestyle. Sin has a price. It always enslaves. It always ensnares. And Herod, as far as we know, rejected Jesus because he thought he was a man he had killed. Sin blinded him to the only one who could give him forgiveness. To the one man who could forgive Herod. The one man who could give Herod the escape route, who had the open door policy for him. Come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Herod rejected him because of his sin. Sin blinds you to your escape route and blinds you to redemption. Well, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. 
Father, is in a time like this when we talk about sin and even a small sin, as people would like to say, it was but just a small sin. Father, even a small sin can pollute our life. It can change our direction. It can hamper our life. It can cause us, Father, great emotional pain and suffering. When all you've said is, come to me and I will give you rest. Oh, Father, if there are those who need to come to you, who have never been born again, let them come tonight and take me by the hand and say, Preacher, I need forgiveness of my sins and I need to receive Jesus as my Savior. And we'll show them in the Bible how to do that. Well, Father God, don't let sin blind them to this opportunity. And then there are those Christians, Father, whose sins creep up in the night sometimes in the darkness of their lives and tends to overwhelm them. But in reality, we can know that forgiveness is real through our own repentance. And help us, Father, to pray for others, especially wayward children or family members who have long since abandoned and left us because of sin. And, oh, Father God, give strength to those who need to be strong and hope to those who need hope that sin is not something, Father, we have to be enslaved to, but you have set us free that we can live our lives in great power and peace. Father God, whatever will be done of yours tonight, let it be done. Whatever decision, let it be done. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.